So um, yeah, I changed the title somewhat of this talk to Evolutionary Branching, Adaptive Radiation, and Meta Community Ecology. I will touch upon all these topics usually at once, um, but before I do that, I'll just briefly go through a well-known example of an adaptive radiation, that of the Darwin finches on the Galapagos Islands. Uh, we know that these finches, they arrived to the islands some uh, two, three million years ago and have since then radiated into a whole suite of different morphs, even species. I have taken the, uh, and, and they occur on many of these islands, uh, usually in, uh, 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 usually many species coexist on the same island. I have color coded some of the distributions here, namely of the uh, ground and cactus finches up here. So you see that there's, on each island, there's a sort of community of interacting finches competing for resources, as far as I know. I'm not a specialist on Darwin finches, and this is not a talk about Darwin finches, just to give you a brief introduction to some of the concepts I will talk about. The classical view of speciation of these finches is a period of allopatry followed by secondary sympatry. So you think of the uh, invasion into one of the islands of some ancestral morph or type that eventually colonizes other islands and adapts to local conditions, changes its ecological character somehow. Uh, that might happen in several steps, but eventually a new type has emerged that is different from the original one that can then coexist with the original type because they have somehow diverged ecologically. Um, there are some problems with this classical view of, of speciation, uh, not only th because it's hard to determine past dist distributions from current distributions, uh, there are some data problems actually finding out what actually happened. Um, also, there is a conceptual problem, I think, and that is that for start, you might want to ask, why does this slightly modified morph not colonize the original habitat? They should be dispersed between the two if the initial colonization was possible. <clears throat> One answer could be that these types are not enough diverged from the original type to actually coexist. So the allopatry you see here is a pattern. But the process might well be local competition and competitive exclusion. Um, moreover, once you have two species that can coexist on one island at least, many they can coexist on several islands, further speciations and further evolution will take place in that context, in that community context of coexisting species interacting, competing for, for seeds or whatever habitat uh, or a niche space, if you wish. <clears throat> so what about this talk then? It'll, it will be a conceptual one. No data, no results, I'm sorry. Uh, there will be conclusions, though. <laughs> I would uh, somehow study the ecological processes, or discuss at least, the ecological processes driving adaptive radiations in heterogeneous environments, such as the adaptive, adaptive radiation of Darwin finches. But there are, of course, many other examples. I will try to focus on ecological diversification and spatial community ecology, for the moment ignoring completely genetics and the emergence of reproductive isolation. Uh, after all, Ecology, I think, is an ecological diversification is somehow a <coughs> uh, necessary for the speciation as we know it in most cases. Um, all right, here's an outline. I will start with a introduction to a toy model I, I will use for some examples. Then discuss evolutionary branching in space uh, with different levels of dispersal that would give rise to different scenarios and different um, 
uh, types of ecological interactions. Um, and uh, finally, discuss complete adaptive radiations in space uh, with a few sample scenarios. So here's the toy model. It consists of two separate habitats. This one over here, that one over here. You may think of them as islands if you wish. There is dispersal between them, passive, so there's a fixed proportion of individuals moving between the islands each generation. Um, I'll also assume that there is a single heritable continuous trait uh, that determines each individual's ability to locally compete for resources, uh, reproduce and survive, and so on. Uh, there is local frequency and density dependence, even local population dynamics, actually. Uh, further, asexual reproduction, small mutations. The small mutations uh, make sure that evolution will be gradual uh, and not a single step from one type of one morph to the other. Uh, I should also say that these islands are supposed to be different somehow, so you would uh, require a different uh, adaptation to be optimally uh, adapted to one or the other. First, a few words about single island evolution. So if we look, just look at one island, one habitat, um, there is uh, some available resources, resources on that habitat, in that habitat, a continuous ecological trait. You might think of it as size, if you wish. So it could be small individuals and large individuals, but there's one type that is best at utilizing the local resources somehow. And if I then run this model and introduce some small types here, there will be mutations and gradual evolution towards this uh, maximal re uh, use of, of, the, uh, of the local resources. <clears throat> If I twiddle, tune the parameters a bit of this model, I will not give you the details because the details are not important. Uh, this is, after all, conceptual talk. Um, I can get what's called evolutionary branching. That is, evolution towards, again, the trait at which you are maximally adapted to, to uh, exploit the local resources, but due to local frequency and density-dependent selection, that is now a fitness minimum. So this is a classical branching point in the way that if everybody uses the same local resource, if there's a distribution of resources, then it might, and there's competition then for this most abundant resource, it might pay off to actually do something else and utilize other resources, other seeds, for instance, on a Galapagos island. And you can get this scenario where you have evolution towards uh, the, the branching point and then evolutionary branching within that island. This is sometimes called competitive speci speciation. Um, okay. Now if I have two islands, I look at the case with very low dispersal between them. So, the probability to move from one to the other in one generation is one in a million or even fewer. I can get this type of scenario, for instance, where I have one type initially colonizing the green island. I have the color coding here, so individuals or, shall I say, uh, clones are represented by these small green squares, and the color or shape determines uh, gives, represents the island that, that they are on. So I have green squares on the green island and orange crosses on the orange island. And I should also say that each dot here represents a clone of at least five individuals, so you don't see the very, very rare types here. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I get initial adaptation to the habitat to, to the maximum resource uh, utilization on the green island. Then there is a colonization 
of the orange one and gradual evolution to utilize that resource maximum. They are different, as I said initially, in terms of what uh, trait is the most, is the sort of the optimal in each place. I can also get something like this, where I have evolutionary branching on, local branching on both islands. So I get, again, evolution towards a branching point locally, and then eventually branching on this island, and then also colonization of the other island, and evolution towards a branch point there, and local branching on that island. Those of you who have sharp eyes might see that this is actually not a simulation. I drew this by hand. That's because I realized too late that I needed this slide as well. <clears throat> anyway, the high dispersal case um, has also been, so far this has been um, quite well understood by, by, by theoreticians a long time. Also the high dispersal case is, has been investigated quite a bit. Um, so if we assume that there's a lot of traffic between these islands, on the order of, shall we say, 10% each generation, uh, then it doesn't really make sense to look at local adaptations and local selection, because everything is everywhere, and uh, any type would have to be evaluated in the context of dispersal here. You have to wait, put dispersal into your fitness function somehow. Uh, so selection is now regional rather than local. Um, and then you can get something like this, which is convergent st stable evolution towards an intermediate trait. So evolution to a, a generalist, if you wish. Some intermediate sized individual that can live quite well in, in both habitats. Or you can get branching. Where, there's a, where the generalist type then is a, um, a branching point. So all types exist on both, in both habitats all the time. You have, get gradual evolution towards an intermediate type and then branching to two specialists, if you wish. What if we have intermediate dispersal. So that was the low dispersal case and high dispersal case. What if dispersal is somewhere in between? There's a huge gap between 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 1. And that gap is not fully investigated by, by theoreticians so far, as, uh, as far as I know anyway. So if we, go, if we are somewhere in between, other things can happen. First of all, you can get something like this, which I call repeated invasions. Uh, I start with a type that first colonizes the, the orange island here. In this scenario, I also have actually difference between the islands. I have one island where only one type is allowed or can, can exist, and, and the other island is more heterogeneous. It allows for more types somehow. Uh, so different types can coexist and co-evolve on that island. And you can get uh, some scenario like this, where, where first you have an initial colonization of the green island, a gradual adaptation towards the resource maximum in, on that island, but as this morph or, or type here evolves to become more better adapted to this island, it opens up niche space for another colonization from the original have it up, up here, and then they co-evolve on this island. Um, one problem with this scenario, well, there's, there's no problem really, it's quite intuitive, but, but, but one question is, where does it happen? You have lots of evolution going on on this island, that's where the action is, but it wouldn't happen without the existence of this type that can uh, repeatedly invade. Another scenario with more or less the same setup uh, is if I start instead on the green island, 
as I showed you earlier, I can get um, evolution towards a branching point. It is a branching point, but the branching is not, uh, the dis disruptive selection is kind of weak. Very often is, in, in, at least in, in many models. And branching can take time. Local evolutionary branching can take time. So this population might just sit on this branching point for, for quite some time, especially if you have finite population size, as I have here. The order of population size is around 500 or so. But these types can colonize the orange habitat, locally adapt to that one, and once we reach this point, then these can readily invade, reinvade the green island, and I get some sort of branching, although it didn't all happen on one island, it happened in the region, more or less. So this is the, I guess, would be the secondary sympathy case that, that has been uh, thought of as, as one driving mechanism of, of the diversification of the Darwin finches. Here's another interesting case that I call subsidized branching. It's uh, yet a case of intermediate levels of dispersal, somewhat higher than we saw in the previous one. Um, The scenario is basically the same, but I get during this diversification, there's repeated colonization from the from the orange island to the uh, green island. Uh, basically, basically because they can. There is niche space after some diversification. There is niche space available on the green island, and you see repeatedly types from the orange island. Um, colonize the green one and replace what was there before. This small population here on the green island is small uh, and evolves very slowly. But evolution on the orange island here is, is direct and rapid. And therefore, this, these uh, types here are repeatedly replaced by sort of pre-adapted immigrants from the orange island. If you only knew, if you only had data from this larger heterogeneous island, you would think that that's a sympatric branching altogether, but it was actually driven by sort of pre-adapted immigrants from another place. What about adaptive radiations? Well, I will say, I'll give you a few scenarios about what can, what can happen. There are many possibilities. Um, first, you can get pleat local radiations if dispersal is low. Uh, so you have invasion of the green habitat and uh, radiation of, into different types, depending on the available resources. And then eventually colonization of the orange habitat and also local diversification in that habitat. Uh, high dispersal case, you can get also an adaptive radiation, but then in the sort of everything is everywhere scenario. In the, in the intermediate dispersal case, you can get lots of things happening. I will show you. Uh, just a couple of, of examples here. You can have repeated invasion, like I showed you before, but ha happening several times. So there is just a single type at an ESS on this orange island, repeatedly invading the green island here with the same morph over and over again, only because there is sort of niche space available due to local uh, local gradual evolution on this green island. Again, you might want to ask the question, where does this happen? Does it happen on the green? Well, on the green island, that's where all the action is, again. But it certainly is a regional phenomenon, I would say. Secondly, if you were given data on these extant populations and uh, worked out their phylogeny, you did all the genetic analysis and so on, you can reach different conclusions. 
either that this radiation happened on the Green Island and then lately it butted off a population onto the Orange Island. Or we can think of many other scenarios that might fit this phylogeny. Just to say that it's hard to know exa exactly what happened in the past, just given current distributions and a phylogeny. Without the fossil record, you couldn't possibly figure this one out. Here's another sort of interesting scenario, we might call it subsidized radiation, where there is possibility for local branching on both islands, but the branching and radiation is actually driven by repeated uh, colonizations back and forth between the islands. So some conclusions. Adaptive radiation in a heterogeneous environment can happen in many ways with shifting bi biogeographic patterns. Regional species co-evolution affects local community ecology and vice versa. There, is, there are processes happening at different scales. There's local interactions, local competitive exclusion, local uh, adaptation, but it all happens within a region where everything is happening in many localities and the uh, regional processes uh, are also, also come into play somehow. Finally, there's a large need for more theory here. This is just a, a, uh, some examples of what, what you can get out of a very, very simple model um, on, on these things. Uh, and to, to work out the, the biogeography bi 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 of diverging populations is not only interesting in its own sense, it also, of course, sets the stage for uh, the evolution of reproductive isolation. What, are the, what is the local community context in which we would expect reproductive isolation to somehow, to somehow evolve? And uh, here is a list of some ongoing and future work I would like to do on this. Uh, together with Mikael Pontarp and Palun Bay in Lund, uh, I'm, we are analyzing this type of models uh, with different parameter settings and so on, looking at the emergent structure of meta-communities. Like, and then studying things like follow genetic, um, um, what's called, I dropped the word now, uh, structuring anyway. Uh, to what extent local communities are, consist of more related species than you would expect from a random choice from the regional pool, or whether the local community is actually, uh, consists of, of species that are less related than you would expect from a random sample from the regional pool. It would be interesting to introduce more than one trait dimension. Uh, this toy model was very, very simple. Uh, you could, for instance, have one trait that determines local adaptation to, to each island, so to speak, and another trait that, was, uh, that would decide the local um, niche separation somehow. So you had one, one niche separation trait and another uh, more adapt, a trait that determines your ability to survive in different <coughs> environments somehow. Uh, of course, a sexual diplet model would be interesting to analyze. But I think environmental stochasticity would be even more interesting with local <coughs> extinctions and recolonizations back and forth. How does that have an effect, does that have any, any effect, and I think it does, on the regional evolution and divergence of ecological types? Thank you for listening. Thank you, it was a very inspiring talk. Questions? Mm -hmm. Maybe I could start off with one. I think your model is, um, is rich enough and has uh, some key elements such as spatial structure and simplest form and we have adaptive evolution on top of that and there is toxicity in your case here, demographic toxicity. Um, so I think this gives you enough 
complexity to start talking about history dependence of the regulation process. Could you comment on that motion? Well, certainly, I mean, the, the uh, I've shown you already a few examples on, on the contingency on, on sort of where, where you start and you can get different developments. Uh, although in the scenarios I showed here, there was no contingency when it comes to, to the end product somehow. And uh, that would of course be interesting to see wh whether it actually depends on, on, on um, where you start, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. And would you, would you comment on how environmental specificity would be different from demographic specificity. So it's obviously not doing quite the same thing, even though there are similarities. So can you speculate a little bit how it would qualitatively affect your patterns? Uh, <clears throat> environmental stochasticity does have the effect on, especially on, on very similar types, that they can't easily coexist. That if you in introduce some stochasticity, then, then if you are too close, if the competition is too strong, you very easily get uh, some stochastic uh, competitive exclusion of one or the other type. And therefore, coexistence on, on the same island will be more rare, uh, and that will have, a, have a, an effect, a strong effect on the evolution of these two, two types. Yeah, so, so similar types are prone to at risk to demographic stochasticity. And especially through uh, uh, environmental stochasticity. Mm -hmm. All right, now it's yeah, wonderful. Let's get the microphone to this thing. Oh, yes, everybody. Yeah, I have to look over here and watch my hand. <laughs> um, so I was wondering a question. If you have uh, a situation like this where you can go to models, all sorts of different scenarios, but ultimately what we want to do is be able to go into nature and try and figure out which of these scenarios or contributions to them are most important. So do you think there will be any signatures that will come out of such a model effort that we can use later the contribution of what? Sorry. Sorry. So didn't, what, the contribution of what? Well, like for instance, uh, supplementation, uh, regional diversification versus other kind of diversification. Um, whether you can separate out the high diversification from the high diversification. I mean, we can try and do that sort of ad hoc fashion, but should there be any patterns that such a modeling effort? Hmm. Good question. And I, I mean, this, this is so. This work is still in its progeny, so I, I haven't really thought of the, exactly what kind of uh, patterns or, or results that could be useful in that sense. But it certainly is a good question. I have to think about it. I, I, I don't know. Would, do you have any suggestions? Well, I'll just be very no, no, no. But it'd be very useful. Yeah, sure. Sure. OK, two more hands over there. We could hand over the other one. So yeah, I wonder what would happen if you had just that genetic variation broad genotype distribution to the model. So I imagine that the things could change quite dramatically if you have Already a broad distribution of, of, of genotypes. Certainly. Certainly, but you, you also have to ask where that, that, does that distribution come from? So, uh, but, but. Yeah, uh, but, but um, why would, I mean, it all, it's all a matter of scale, I guess. I mean, wh what are the differences between th these habitats? How many mutations do you need to go from one specialist to the other specialist, and so on? And, and uh, uh, I don't know. In some cases, it would perhaps make a difference, but in many cases, it would not make such a big, big difference, I think, in the outcome. Although that's a guess, because uh, I haven't tried it. But, but uh, I know from other models that, that uh, the mutation step size, well, it, it speeds things up, but, but the end result might be quite similar still. And I mean, the, the ecological mechanisms are, are still there. The selection for one type or the other branching points is on. They don't ch really change once you introduce larger genetic variability. Okay, we have three more questions. The gentleman in the dark blue shirt is first. 
someday, yes. Yeah, speciation, speciation is defined as, as the establishment of a reproductive barrier, but, but I mean, speciation also has many steps, and this is sort of the first step. If, if you view this uh, not as an asexual model, but, but actually uh, the diversification of, of alleles within a, a sexual population, uh, that's a, one interpretation of, of these results. Uh, so, yeah, this is the first step, but if you want to go the, take the full step to speciation, you would have to somehow do it more complicated. Uh, <laughs> and, but I don't know. It, it perhaps lies in the future somehow. We'll see. Okay. Yes. Okay. Let's get back to the Darwin field. Oh. Uh, these, these are diploid species and uh, lots of genetic, lots of genetic variation within uh, a population uh, in a in a style. And I would like to ask you that uh, in light of the new results, which uh, shows that there are bimodal distributions within a population and uh, it changes also over an island. Uh, what do you think about the relative significance of allopatric and sympatric processes in speciation of uh, Darwin fish? Because that goes back to the question that what happens really in a deeper population where within a, uh, an island that can be drastic uh, uh, genetic and ecological differences between various forms uh, together with regular hybridization of, uh, let's say, eight percent. Well, one answer is to that question is that the scenarios I've showed you might be the uh, origin of that genetic diversity that you see within species today on the Galapagos. Uh, so. The graphs, you, you might interpret them as uh, not as single species, but, but rather morphs or, or, or alleles also diversifying within a single species. So, I mean, this might be an answer to that question. Where does the within species diversity come from? Okay, but, 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 uh, It's more like a comment from new students about the same conceptual, big conceptual issues that stuff that is there presented, but still, like, you two groups put emphasis on predominance of different factors. For example, you don't make any inference of the possible importance of relative fecundity in the different habitats, or the relative, uh, import, uh, relative uh, availability of resources in the different habitats in determining what's going to be the fate of, of uh, divergence or no divergence. I guess the question is, it, is, uh, is it of concern that you're not integrating or not planning to integrate factors that seem to be of importance, such as relative fecundity in different environments? But I, I, I did have differences in relative fecundity. Uh, I mean, they were depending on... on a different way. A different way. Well, you can do it many ways. Uh, I'm not really sure what you are after, but... Maybe we can discuss it afterwards. Maybe it's more a question of emphasis on your model is capable of having differential fecundities. It's just whether one explores the effect. Hmm. <laughs> I still don't really understand the question, sorry. But, but uh, maybe you have an answer if you understood it. Oh. OK, any further questions? Right, thank you very much. Once more, you're good. Thank you.